I love the Versus series. So you know, I'm absolutely thrilled to see Capcom bringing the series back from the brink with the new Marvel vs. Capcom collection. And now, I guess as well as the announced while recording this, Capcom vs. SNK ports we're getting. God damn, Capcom, you're spoiling me. So I figured, why not pass the time waiting for that thing to draw by giving the franchise the old Appearances series treatment. And not just the Marvel vs. Capcom games, but the Versus series as a whole. And really take a look at just who is playable in all these games. But before we can start naming names and dating dates, we've got to ask ourselves, what is a Capcom vs. game? I mean, truly. Is it just any old crossover game between Capcom and another property? Do the Versus games include games where Capcom crosses over with itself? Does it even have to have Versus in the title? Well, I did a bit of searching, and the only sort of authority I could find on the matter was the Capcom Wiki, which lays out the Versus series as this. A series of Capcom-developed crossover games, primarily sharing, though not limited to, the fighting game genre. As of recording, the entirety of the Versus series is actually comprised neatly of four subseries, with each of those being its own different crossover series between four different companies. The first, and most well-known, being the crossover games with Marvel Comics, more commonly known as the Marvel vs. Capcom series, but also includes two previous made Capcom fighting crossovers that predate the first MVC, being the vs. Street Fighter games. Also, though directly inspired from sneaky guest appearances in two previous games even before those two, X-Men Coda and Marvel Super Heroes are not counted as versus titles. Then, the crossover games with rival fighting game company SNK, the Capcom vs. SNK series, though again, only the ones developed by Capcom. Thirdly, the fighting games created in partnership with Japanese animation company Tatsunoko, the Tatsunoko vs. Capcom games. And finally, a crossover series with Bandai Namco, known as the Cross series, though mainly comprised of single-player tactical RPGs. For the purposes of this video, our main attention will be with its singular fighting game entry, Street Fighter Cross Tekken. Now, to be frank, I'm not quite sure what authority these guys have on dictating what makes something an official versus game or just some weird other thing, but most other websites seem to parrot this same exact definition, and I couldn't find any official series lists or anything like that, so we're just gonna roll with this. And look, if you're upset that I won't be covering this game or this game or... <laughs> even this game. Just know I'll probably cover it eventually whenever I make appearances videos on these other respective series as a whole. Alright cool, now that we have the setup, let's get into the rules. Rule number one, games have to have some sort of multiplayer mode to be considered for the list. With the abundance of fighting games on this list, this really isn't an issue. Hell, I was even able to include the mobile port of Street Fighter Cross Tekken, though this does mean we shall not be counting the single-player tactical RPGs of the Cross series. Rule number two, ports and compilations will only be counted as separate games if they include exclusive original new characters or severely scaled-back rosters in the cases of demakes. You see, most home ports usually like to include fun bonus characters like unplayable final bosses or souped up versions of already existing base roster characters, and including them all as separate entries would make this list unnecessarily cluttered. So instead of logging them as whole new entries, I'll just be letting you know if any characters are port exclusives under the characters themselves. Rule number three secret characters. Okay, look, if it's some type of character or variation on a character that I can select on the character select screen through a code, then that is a secret character. Though obviously not counting simple things like using different punches and kicks to select different alt colors. Rule number five, these characters have to be selectable through legitimate means, meaning no characters locked behind hacks, as well as no modded characters. And for this last one, this is more of a clarification than a rule, even if the game contains characters that aren't explicitly stated to be part of the crossover, they'll still be counted. 
This includes guest characters not directly associated with any of the companies involved in the game's title, as well as original characters made for these games specifically. And even with all these rules in place, we still have an absolutely record-breaking 237 characters, somehow, across only 15 total games. For reference, that's close to 50 plus more than the amount of characters in my original Mario appearances video, with only 14% of the amount of games counted in that video. Yep, this is gonna be a big one, folks. So, if you enjoy this video, be sure to do the usual, like, maybe even subscribe if you're feeling crazy. Oh, and by the way, if you've ever wanted to look at the data I've collected from this video, as well as the previous appearances projects I've worked on, I've got them all wrapped up in neat little spreadsheets over on my Patreon. Support me and get access to that, as well as much more for as little as $1 a month. Anyway, enough shilling, let's get on with the video. And of course, with this many characters in the running, you know that close to half of them are just gonna be one-timers. Starting with the two secret characters from X-Men vs. Street Fighter, we have Street Fighter Alpha Chun-Li. Just hold the start button for 5 seconds before selecting regular Chun-Li, and you'll be able to play as her in her Street Fighter Alpha fit. No gameplay changes or nothing, just a different look, but hey, it's technically a secret character. But then we get on to our next entry, Hyper Chun-Li, a character supposedly playable in the PS1 port of X-Men vs. Street Fighter. Now, why do I say supposedly? Well, you see, while doing my research for this video, every single website I came across while looking into the secret characters of X-Men vs. Street Fighter, be it the Strategy Wiki, GameFAQs, and even random Turkish ROM websites, all bring up Hyper Chun-Li in her supposed PS1 appearance. Not anything about the character, mind you, not what they look like or what makes them any different from regular Chun-Li, no. Just the name of the character as well as the code to unlock them. Supposedly, all you have to do is hover over Chun-Li, hold select for a non-specified amount of time, and just press R1. But unfortunately, every time I try, no matter for how long or how short of a time I hold the select button, it always just gives me Alpha Chun-Li. So naturally, after trying and failing about a million times, and searching the internet for any sort of proof of her existence and coming up with nothing, I decided to do some digging. And after said digging was dug, I came across the only source that I could find that mentioned Hyper Chun-Li that wasn't a forum post, and possibly even the source of all this confusion. Issue 69 of Power Station Magazine, a now defunct gaming magazine from the UK with a focus on PlayStation games. Where, when answering some kid writing into their tips and cheats column, they responded with this. Nah, it just wouldn't be cricket. Surely your mate is kicking your butt simply because he's better at the game than you? The only answer is to practice, practice, practice. Did the karate kid ask for Chase to beat the Cobra Cons? No. It's not the Miyagi, don't wait. He creates outed that old bloke's fence, then walks his car for hours on end. Wait a minute, what a mug! Fair enough then, he has some cheats. Phew. Oh, and look, the first one they bring up is the code for Hyper Chun-Li, who's apparently supposed to be faster and stronger than the regular Chun-Li, saying you have to hold select for 5 seconds and then hit R1, which I did, and it still didn't fucking work. Yep, the game still just gave me Alpha Chun-Li who, I couldn't help but notice, they didn't bring up at all when talking about the game's various cheats. So I boiled it down to two options. A. They were just talking about Alpha Chun-Li and made up the whole part about her having any sort of noticeable gameplay difference. Or B. There's just some weird unlock requirement that no one online has detailed and that I don't have the time to go searching for. Either way, this character probably doesn't belong on this list, but until there's definitive proof that she just doesn't exist, I'll just plop her right here. 
Moving right along, we have the secret characters of Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter, with the Marvel characters of Armored Spider-Man, US Agent, and Mephisto. Though, unfortunately, although Mephisto has a pretty distinct look in the comics, for some reason in-game they decided to make him a red palette swap of his son, Blackheart. Although, fun fact, Blackheart was originally supposed to have a new super for this game, where he would summon Mephisto to attack the opponent, the graphics for which are actually still in the game files, so we can actually get a look at what Mephisto would have looked like in this game. Though I can't say I have any idea why they decided to make him a giant weird grey bird thing. But now we get into the secret characters of the Capcom side, and with them comes a little bit of lore, starting with Dark Sakura. As the story goes, apparently, during their visit to the Marvel Universe, she and Ryu decided to train a bit for the upcoming fight against Apocalypse by sparring at the beach, where, after falling asleep while not wearing sunblock, Sakura awakened and found herself not just with a painful sunburn, but also unlimited access to the power of the Satsui no Hado, somehow with none of the downsides. Well, I guess aside from the added risk of skin cancer. But then we have Mech Zangief. While in the main Capcom universe there are Mech Zangiefs that are actual robots, in the MVC universe things are a bit different. Apparently, during his trip to the Marvel Universe, Geef was also able to tap into some sort of new power, stumbling across a new technique that transformed him completely into metal, and gave him some strange new abilities on top of that. But unfortunately, as it turns out, these abilities were connected to Psycho Power, leaving him vulnerable to Bison's influence, causing him to desperately search for a way to return to normal. Though, I should also bring up, while not being separate characters, in MVC 1 and 2, Sakura and Geef have the ability to swap into their dark and mecha versions at any point in the fight, only at the cost of a little bit of meter. Which I guess also means Geef eventually did find a way to return to normal, and learned how to control his power. So that's a fun bit of lore. Then we have Shadow. If you're familiar with the story of Charlie Nash, Guile's mentor slash best friend who wound up being murdered to death by M. Bison via helicopter, the Versus universe actually changes that up a bit too. Instead of being killed by Bison, he actually gets captured instead, where Bison transforms Ooh, him Bison into his own that. personal psycho-infused attack cyborg. Get ready for this to become a trend. Because we are at our next one-timer with the boss character Cyber Akuma, this time transformed into a bio-organic slave for the X-Men villain Apocalypse, making him into the honorary fifth member of his Four Horsemen. And to cap off Marvel vs. Street Fighter, we have an odd case of a completely original character in these crossover games, Norimaru a gag character created in collaboration with Capcom by Japanese comedian Noritaki Kanashi. He's only playable in the Japanese arcade and home console ports of Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter, and due to licensing issues is rumored to being removed from the upcoming MVC collection, which is a huge shame. Now, I can't go into too much detail with this guy right now, as this character has a development backstory so insane that I have decided I'm going to make a whole separate video just talking about it, so be on the lookout for that. Finally, moving on to Marvel vs. Capcom 1, and on to the last batch of secret one-timers, starting with, oh my god, Shadow Lady. That cyborg-loving fuck did it again. Were the dolls not enough for you, man? Between that and the evil clones and like the 12 different Seths, you'd think he'd be satisfied. Okay, well, before I completely lose my goddamn mind here, in reality, Shadow Lady is actually a non-canon character. Well, as much of a canon as these games have, anyway. In Chun-Li's ending in this game, Bison captures her and attempts to transform her like he did to Shadow, but winds up being foiled by Shadow himself. 
So with Bison being unsuccessful, Shadow Lady is more of a playable what if. Having her moveset focused more into her cybernetic enhancements and lacking any psycho powers. And what happens in Shadow Lady's arcade ending, you ask? Well, she and Shadow save a critically injured Jin Saotome's life by transforming him into Shadow Jin. Oh, god damn it. And then we have Lilith, with her appearance in this game being its own little bag of worms. Because Lilith doesn't quite look like her usual self in this game. And that's because, for some completely unexplained reason, in Lilith's arcade mode, she and Morgan are revealed to have somehow swapped bodies. And this character is actually referred to as Lilith Mode Morgan. Though, if Lilith's brain is in Morrigan's body, wouldn't it make much more sense just to call her Morrigan Mode Lilith? Well, I guess it doesn't really matter, as Lilith just winds up getting stuck in Zangief's body anyway. Lilith Mode Zangief when, Capcom? Then, we have another console exclusive with Magnetic Shockwave Mega Man. I've actually talked about this character before in a past video, so I'll just keep it short and simple here. He's a separate version of Mega Man selectable through a secret code, with the only change being he gains access to a new super, originally belonging to Magneto. Then we have the console-exclusive playable boss character of Onslaught, as well as his three evil goons, Orange Hulk, Red Venom, and Gold War Machine also known as MSH Performance Hulk, High Speed Venom, and Hyper Armor War Machine in Japan. While in the American version, these guys basically share the exact same win quotes and personality as their regular counterparts, their stories are a bit different in Japan, being psychically created clone slaves for Onslaught and his conquest of Earth, though they would eventually turn on their master to help defeat him. The fucked up part is, though, is that these clones carry all the memories and thoughts of their original counterparts, and knowing that they are evil knockoffs to their original counterparts upsets them greatly, even to the point of begging their tag partner to put them down in one of their win quotes for endangering the lives of the innocent. Look, man, I just wanted to abuse the double war machine cheese. I didn't know this was gonna come with all this emotional baggage. And but, but, but before anyone says anything, yes, N, Orange Hulk, technically did make an appearance years later in the pages of Uncanny X-Force, but that's a completely different Orange Hulk with no relation to the Versus series. And finally, with all that out of the way, no more complicated backstories, no more lore, it's time to just breeze through the rest of the one-timers. Moving on to MVC2, we have... oh wait, crap, Bone Claw Wolverine. Bone Claw Wolverine. Why? is what many people first ask upon seeing this character. Why two Wolverines? Well, the answer is actually very simple. The dev team wanted to do a Bone Claw version of Wolverine for MVC2. Marvel said they wanted the Adamantium version, so they just decided to do both. Funny how that works. He has minor gameplay changes to regular Wolvie, with his main draw being an exclusive assist that hits low, but they might as well be the exact same goddamn character. After which, we have the other exclusive playable mutants of MVC2. Cable, Marrow, Iceman, Colossus, Psylocke, Silver Samurai, and Spiral. As well as the one-timer Capcom characters of Hayato, Servbot, BB Hood, and Anakuris. As well as the three characters made original for this game, being Rubyheart, Sanson, and Domingo. This was just another spur-of-the-moment decision by the development team. They just kinda wanted to make their own characters, each for separate reasons. Someone on the team wanted to create a character that served as a reimagining of an old arcade shmup classic, so they just made one. Someone else on the team wanted a Capcom character with crazy unique movement to stand out from the cast, so they just made one. And finally, they wanted a cool original character that could play the marquee role similar to Ryu or Cyclops, so they just made one. Moving on to the only one-timers for the Versus SNK franchise, all contained within CVS2, we have the SNK characters of Athena, Haomaru, Hibiki, Rock Howard, Ryu Haku, and Shang. 
Then, with the Capcom characters of Eagle, Maki, Kiyosuke, and Yoon. As well as the console-exclusive boss characters of Shinakuma, and a original character made just for this game, God Rugal. Which is a super-powered form of Rugal he obtained after absorbing the powers of the Orochi and the Satsui no Hado. And over at the Tatsunoko games, we have another odd case with Hakushun Daimao, this cartoon genie guy. With him only being playable in the Wii port of Cross Generation, he wound up actually getting removed in the international port due to licensing issues. Rumors tend to go back and forth on whether it was because they couldn't decide on who owned the character in America, or that the Italian rights holders just got a bit too greedy with the price to use him, but for whatever reason, he's a Japanese exclusive. And then we have the three characters introduced and only playable in Ultimate All-Stars, Joe the Condor, Tekka Man, and Yatterman 2. Likewise, over at Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, we have the three characters only playable in that game, Phoenix Wright, Iron Fist, and Virgil. Which, honestly, that last one is probably for the best. And although he doesn't count for this list, I might as well also bring up Galactus, the boss of both versions of 3, who's only playable in Ultimate in a secret single-player Galactus mode. And finally, we arrive. The part everybody absolutely adores, the game with the most amount of one-timers, Street Fighter Cross Tekken. On the Tekken side, we have Elisa, Asuka, Bob, Brian, Christy, Jack X, Jin, Julia, Kuma, Lars, Law, Lei, Lily, Marduk, Ogre, Raven, Steve, Xiao Yu, and Yoshimitsu. And on the Street Fighter side, we have Abel, Cody, Guy, Elena, Dudley, Ibuki, Jury, Poison, and Rufus as well as the PlayStation-exclusive characters of Cole from Infamous, the Japanese PlayStation mascots Kuro and Toro, as well as the two company mascots Bad Box Art Mega Man and Pac-Man. Oh, by the way, if you're wondering why Mega Man is, well, like that in this game, or why Pac-Man is out riding a mech that looks like a tree with a face, I made a whole video about that. Go check it out. And finally, to close us off, we have the newcomers of the latest game in the Versus series, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, with Captain Marvel, Black Widow, Black Panther, Winter Soldier, Gamora, Ultron, Sigma, Mega Man X, Monster Hunter, and Jetta. Whew! That was a lot. Sorry to front-load the video like that, guys, but these games are just filled with surprising amount of weird-ass characters that just can't go unexplained. Though, from here on out, things should be relatively straightforward. On to the two-timers, starting with the Capcom characters. With MVC2 recycling so many characters from past entries, naturally we have a bunch that only appeared in two and one other game. Starting with Charlie Nash, only playable in two as well as X-Men vs. Street Fighter. Yeah, I guess he sort of just got better after the whole being turned into a cyborg thing. So much for the lore. Along with the characters Jin, Captain Commando, and Mega Man, who only appear outside of 2 in MVC1. Then we have the characters only to appear in the two MVC3 versions with Trish, Amaterasu, Wesker, Sea Viper, and Shenko. As well as the two characters introduced in Ultimate MVC3, lucky enough to be brought over to MVC Infinite with Firebrand and Nemesis T Type. And over at the CVS side, we have a pretty strange bunch with the EX characters of SNK1 and Pro. While holding start on some characters on the character select screen, you'll be able to play as slightly altered versions of said character, though not every character gets an EX counterpart. The ones who do exist are EX versions of Balrog, Blanca, Kami, Chun-Li, Dalsim, E-Honda, Guile, Ken, M. Bison, Sagat, Sakura, Vega, and Zangief. Then we have the final two outliers, starting with Saki, a weird little character who apparently originates from a Capcom arcade quiz show slash dating game? She's playable in the original Wii port and Ultimate versions of Tatsunoko vs. Capcom. And to finish off Capcom, we have a recent EVO champion, Hugo Andore, 
He's playable in both the console and mobile ports of Street Fighter Cross Tekken. Now onto the Marvel two-timers, we're actually starting off with a special boss character, Apocalypse, the main villain of both X-Men and Marvel superheroes vs. Street Fighter, only playable in the home ports of each game. Then we have the characters playable in MVC2 and one other game, starting with the playable mutants of Sabretooth, Rogue, and Juggernaut from X-Men vs. Street Fighter, as well as the characters playable in Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter, Blackheart, and Omega Red. Then we have War Machine, only in MVCs 1 and 2. And then Thanos, the only character to first be playable in MVC2, but later be playable all the way down the line in MVC Infinite. Then we have the Marvel characters playable in the two versions of MVC3, Deadpool, Super Skrull, X-23, MODOK, She-Hulk, Phoenix, and Taskmaster. And finally, the Marvel characters from Ultimate MVC3 who made it into Infinite, Doctor Strange, Ghost Rider, Hawkeye, Nova, and Rocket Raccoon. Now at the SNK two-timers, we have the aforementioned EX characters from all those games, with EX Benimaru, Geese, Kim, King, Kyo, Mai, Vice, Yuri, Yamazaki, Raiden, Ryo, and Terry. And for our only SNK two-timer that's not an EX character, we have Joe Higashi, playable in CVS2, and the version before that, Capcom vs. SNK Pro, a revised version of the first game that, while suffered from slightly longer load times and downgraded graphics, added new modes, as well as two new characters, being Joe Higashi and Dan Hibiki. It's really funny, too, because they went all out making these two the center of the advertising for this game. Like, dude, we can finally see the epic matchup between Dan and Joe! Holy, Holy fuck. fuck! Our only Tatsunoko two-timer is Ipatsu Man, introduced in the Wii port in Playable and Ultimate. And to close off the two-timers, we say goodbye to the last of our Tekken characters. Playable in the home console version and its mobile port, we have Kazuya, Heihachi, Nina, Paul, Huarong, and King. Back at it with the three-timers once again, starting with the Capcoms. We have Jill Valentine, Tron Bon, and Felicia, debuting in MVC2 and lucky enough to make it into both versions of 3. After which we have Frank West, who actually first debuted in Ultimate Tatsunoko vs. Capcom, before making it into Ultimate MVC3 and MVCI. As well as the characters introduced in the MVC3 games who also made it into Infinite with Chris, Dante, Arthur, Spencer, and Hagar. Then onto the two Capcom characters, only playable in all three CVS games with Evil Ryu, as well as my personal hero, Edmund Honda. Then we have Rolento, who was only added at the end of CVS2, but was lucky enough to make it into both versions of Cross Tekken. And to finish us off, we have the Capcom characters only found in all three versions of TVC, with Batsu, Kaijin no Soki, Mega Man Volnut, PTX40A, and another personal favorite of mine, Alex Third Strike. Then back to the Marvel side, we have Cyclops and Gambit, with both being playable in X-Men vs. Street Fighter and MVC2, but with each game in between being different. And speaking of MVC1, we have Venom, playable in that game as well as 2, but also managing to ooze his way into MVCI's DLC roster. Followed by the characters playable in 2 as well as both versions of 3, being Doctor Doom and Sentinel. And finally, the two characters playable in both 3s and into MVCI with Thor and the Dread Dormammu. And then to send off our SNK characters, we have Benny Maru, Geese Howard, Yori Yagami, Kim Kapwan, King, Kyo Kusanagi, Mai Shiranui, Nakoruru, Orochi Iori, Raiden, Rugal Bernstein, Ryo Sakazaki, Ryuji Yamazaki, Vice, Yuri Sakazaki, and the main man himself, Terence. 
as well as saying goodbye to our final Tatsunoko characters with Kashan, Doranjo, Gold Lidan, June the Swan, Karis, Ken the Eagle, Palomar, Tekaman Blade, and Yatterman 1. And as sad as I am to see these two franchises go, at least we won't have to jump around so much, right? Back to the Capcom side with the four timers, starting off with Dan. No luck with him in the Tatsunoko or Cross games, but he did make it into at least two versus SNK and Marvel versus games, so good for Dan. Moving on to Strider Hear You, appearing in four MVC games, though weirdly enough wasn't base roster for MVC3, I always forget that. Then we have a Beautiful Joe, not only playable in both versions of MVC3, he was also playable in the two Wii versions of TVC. Though one character who only showed up in Ultimate TVC is Mega Man X's Zero. But to balance it out, he would make his way into Infinite with his good buddy X. And to finish off the four timers on the Capcom side, we have four characters to make it into every single CVS game, as well as the console versions of Cross Tekken. We have the Beastman Blanca, and the three Shadaloo Kings, Balrog, Vega, and Sagat. Then, on the Marvel side, getting to the end here, we have the two fucking menaces of MVC2, with Storm and Mag fucking Nito, who were also playable in the MVC3s, as well as X-Men vs. Street Fighter. And swap out that X-Men for a Marvel superheroes, and you have the fan favorite, Shuma Gorath. Too bad he didn't make it into Infinite. Unlike our final fourth timer, the Invincible Iron Man. Now we arrive at the five timers, with our only one being the Capcom character of Roll from Mega Man, who, while on one hand, is considered the worst character of the two Marvel vs. games she's in, but wound up being a high tier menace in all three Tatsunoko games, so good for her! At the six timers on the Capcom side now, with a familiar tale of the same follow up games, but the different starting points, with Kami showing up first in X Men vs. Street Fighter, and Sakura instead showing up first in Marvel Super Heroes. And our only Capcom six timer that doesn't fit that mold being Colonel William Guile, being only playable in MVC2 as far as Marvel titles, but snags his sixth appearance in the mobile version of Cross Tekken. And now, sadly, we come to the end of the Marvel characters. That's right, no Marvel character actually makes full appearances across the entire MVC series. It's a four-way tie between Wolverine, who appears in X-Men vs. Street Fighter but not Infinite, and Captain America, Spider-Man, and the Hulk, who make appearances in Infinite but not X-Men vs. Street Fighter. You know, it's funny, a series that started as a celebration of mutants, ending in a game that didn't allow a single one in. Truly, Charles Xavier has taught us nothing. The dream is dead. And with the Marvel characters out of the way, it's Capcom from here all the way up. We should be able to just blast through these last few. At seven total appearances, we have, surprisingly, Ken. Yeah, the versus crossover games just don't have much use for Ken. With so many cool characters to choose from, and Ryu being in every single one of them. I know spoilers, but come on, you saw the thumbnail. I guess it just doesn't make much sense to pick him, being just a different flavored Ryu and all that. Though he is always a shoe in for the more Street Fighter oriented crossovers. And sharing the exact appearances as Ken is Street Fighter's big bad, M. Bison. And at 8 timers, we actually have Dalsum and Zangief. Starting with the old Geefster, of course THE grappler of all time would find his way into a ton of titles. Playable in every Marvel game up till 2, every versus SNK, and even cross Tekken. And while Dalsum wouldn't quite make it into MVC1, he did manage to slide his way into the mobile port of cross Tekken. At 9 appearances, we have the raging demon himself, Akuma. 
being the secret character that basically planted the seed for the entirety of the Marvel vs. series, and maybe even Capcom crossovers as a whole, unsurprisingly Akuma's appeared playable in a ton of these titles. Though the same can't be said about his contemporary Anita, that's a shame. Though his first appearance in an actual versus game would again be as a secret character in X-Men vs. Street Fighter. Though I guess the term secret character here is kind of generous. I mean, all you have to do is just press up past the characters on the top row. I mean, really, secret character? A fucking five-year-old could find this. He would jump around a bit, being MIA in MVC1, but later make it to 2, both versions of 3, as well as the CVS games and Cross Tekken. And at the last slot before the finale, at 11 appearances, we surprisingly have a non-Street Fighter character. The queen of being in everyone else's games because hers is never fucking coming out, Morrigan, the sensational succubus from the unfairly ignored Darkstalkers series. As you can imagine, as soon as she sunk her fangs into Marvel vs. Capcom 1, she had a flawless record, on top of making it into the CVS and Tatsunoko games on top of that. The only series she didn't manage to crop up in being the Cross Tekken games, though part of me is surprised she didn't manage to worm her way into that series either. And, at the end, at 15 total appearances, who else would it be but the big two? Of course, I'm talking about Chun-Li and Ryu from Streets. It really was no surprise that these two would make it to the top at the end. Anything Street Fighter related has to have Ryu and Chun-Li after all. They are in everything. And I'm just gonna call it now, they're probably gonna be at the top in the Street Fighter appearances video too. I mean, maybe Chun-Li will have one off appearance or something, maybe, but Ryu's just that fucking guy. And yeah, that was the video. Hope you guys enjoyed. Maybe you learned something new about this crazy series of games, got a good scope of where you can play as your favorite characters, or just had good background noise to sleep to. You know, whatever works. And of course, I've gotta shout out my patrons real quick, especially that foul miscreant Dean. If you couldn't tell, I love talking about fighting games, so this was a lot, but still a blast to do. And be sure to look forward to more fighting game stuff from me in the future. Anyway, thanks for all the support. I'll see y'all next time. Peace.